When trudging through creationist videos, one can often notice an intriguing lack of understanding of the topic of, well, evolution in general, of course, but for the purposes of this video, we'll focus more specifically on the topic of transitional species. The mention of said species commonly finds itself in such arguments as there were never found any transitional species, or the such and such fossil does not belong to a transitional species, it is a fully developed member of a such and such kind, etc. This betrays ignorance of the concept of transitional species and actually species in general. But how? Well, the answer to this is actually not entirely intuitive for a layperson, like me, which is probably why the arguments mentioned early actually work on quite a few people. They operate on a very basic, no further thought required level. We, however, will try to approach it from another perspective to incorporate the scientific view. So, let's start at a logical place for when we talk about the transition from one species to another. Two species separated in time. Species A is the ancestral species to species B. They can be any two species that have this relation, doesn't matter for the purposes of this presentation. In fact, to help with the visualization, let's simplify this even further. Now species A is represented by color red and species B is represented by color blue. Of course, as I've said, this is a simplification. In reality, no species differentiate from each other by just one specific trait. The nature of the genetic code, the vastness of it, and the amount of genes that change between even the individuals is thus that having such a neat separation is statistically impossible. But, as overly simplistic as it is, it does provide an easy-to-understand visual representation, which we'll just imagine describes more than one trait in one color. So, now we add a third point. This is our transitional species, an intermediate between species A and species B. This is how transitional species are often represented by many creationists, as a hybrid of species A and species B, the crocoduck, the fishibibian, the amphitiles and rap birds, in other words, as some magical chimerae, the Frankenstein's monstrous disparate combination of parts of two species or even kinds of organisms. The problem is that not only this idea operates under a vast oversimplification of actual reality, but it also assumes that living things are almost made out of interchangeable Lego bricks, making it a twofer of a failure. Is it any wonder that if this is the creationist's idea of missing links that there are still missing? But if that's not the case, what is? Well, let's continue to approach it step by step. By mixing the traits of two species into something truly in between. Sure, some traits actually are pretty much binary and are activated or deactivated by flipping the genetic switch. But as we've established, the difference between the two species is virtually guaranteed to be more complicated than just such a switch. We we'll return to why this is a bit later, but for now let's discuss another common talking point of creationists. A half of the feature is useless, it has to be all or nothing. Typically such examples as half a wing, half an eye or some such are used, which again betrays the misunderstanding of biology. First, it assumes that evolution has some final goal, like a wing or an eye, as if it was a human designer with a final product in mind. This is completely wrong, of course. A trait can only stick in the gene pool of a population if and only if it does not detract from its survivability. So, indeed, if the trait was not only useless but harmful, it more than likely wouldn't stand the test of time, which would prevent all the half a wings and half an eyes, unless they had benefits of their own. Sure, a primitive light sensitive spot in a photosynthetic protist may not see as well as an eye of an eagle, but it does help to find a place with enough light to gather the necessary energy to survive. Sure, a short arm with non-flight feathers can be used to fly, but in a warm-blooded theropod, the soft down can be used as a thermal insulator. But let's return to our topic and ask ourselves, why did we select just one point in between the two species? Obviously, something was going on before our transitional species point and after it, right? Yep, of course there was. But unless we've picked the very first living organism for our species A, which would be quite tricky indeed, and our species B is going extinct, our picture is still incorrect. There, that's better. Should be obvious, but often there is some intuitive assumption that species A and species B are the real species, and that the transitional species are somehow not, that they're just transitional. Of course, put into a new perspective, our species A and species B are no more and no less transitional or real. In our color metaphor, they also have a mixture of them, just like our transitional species. 
But a question remains, what happened in the gaps that we still have in our picture? Should we just keep adding new points for each new gap? Or should we eliminate the gaps altogether? Remember that if there actually was a real gap, that would mean that the entire population died out at some point in time, which would be the end of this lineage, i.e. its extinction, which means that there could have been no such gaps. Which would lead us to this picture. Now that's more like it, an uninterrupted history of transition from species A to species B, where at any point in time there was a population with their own set of traits. But now there's a new inaccuracy in your presentation, isn't there? At any point in time it is represented by just one single color, which would imply that at any given point in time the population consisted of genetic clones. That's obviously not how it is in reality, so let's fix that too. Much more like it. This, of course, instantly trips another favorite of creationists, the idea that changes in a genetic code make the resulting organism some sort of mutated aberration, as if any population of living things has a standardized uniform genetic code with no deviations between the organisms. At this point, we're looking at still admittedly simplified but already serviceable representation of the gradual evolution. This is how Darwin and his first proponents saw the process of evolution. A slow but constant change that, through random mutations and natural selections, results in the gene pool of the species becoming so different from the gene pool its ancestors had some time ago, that they would be considered different species were they alive at the same time. However, gradualism, as it's called, is obsolete nowadays, as numerous code minds of Stephen Jay Gould would be more than happy to inform you. What they won't mention, though, is that it was replaced by an even more parsimonious understanding of the process of evolution, which is the punctuated equilibrium model. In simple terms, it acknowledges that a genetic trait can be spread much more quickly through a smaller population, which means that when the environment changes, be it actual environment or predator spray changes, parasites and infections, etc., the population dwindles, since it has a harder time surviving now. But this forces the speed of evolution to increase proportionally, leading to the faster adaptation in times of crisis and slower, more stable populations when the environment is relatively changeless and the population is adapted to it well enough. Note that it doesn't mean that the population is entirely unchanging in those periods of stability, there is still the phenomenon of genetic drift, which basically means that changes still find their way into the gene pool, even if there is little to no selective pressure for them. This is one of the reasons why species would have more than one trait separating them from each other. Also, that does provide us with a reason to even call something species and give them all these cute, easy to remember Latin names. While there is still no obvious division, no line that can be drawn to say that this is no longer species A, it is now species B, which is not how evolution works anyway, at the very least it does provide some semblance of grouping as opposed to gradualism, where it would make no sense since all the generations would have roughly the same gene pool as their ancestors and their offspring. With this picture in mind we can already see what kind of fossil we would find if we were to look for a transitional species between species A and B. First, it would have a mix of their traits, most of them in less specialized form than those found in species B, but in more specialized form than those found in species A. It wouldn't be over-specialized, since that would likely result in its extinction once the environment inevitably changes again. Second, since it would be much less statistically likely to find a specimen from the relatively much smaller populations of the time of crisis and result in accelerated evolution, it would be fully formed, as creationists called it, which means, simply put, adapted to the environment it lives in well enough to sustain a more or less constant population. Thirdly, it would live in the environment that is close to both the environment species A and B lived in, but not the same, different in some ways to necessitate the change. And, of course, species confirming to this criteria have been found. In fact, since we've established before that pretty much any species that didn't go extinct without leaving any offspring should be considered transitional, most of the fossils found probably do belong to the specimens of such species. Of course, not all of them belong to the same straight line, which brings us to this branching pattern. I've mentioned before the common mistake of thinking that evolution is somehow goal-oriented, when it is, in fact, not. This means that there is no straight line of progression that could be drawn. None of the branches are a trunk. None of them are more or less important. Some branches might lead to extinction, while some might not, and keep branching into more and more species. 
or they might not change much, since, as we've seen with the punctuated equilibrium model, the most drastic changes occur when the environment changes, a species that found its niche in a relatively unchanging environment might continue to exist with a relatively unchanging gene pool, modified only by the process of the genetic drift and therefore rarely, if ever, branching out into new species. But that's more of an exception than the rule. Let's look at another, more common occurrence. While the two branches are relatively new, some cross-branch breeding might occur. As you've seen already, there is no easy border between species to be found. The common way to differentiate between them is to see whether they can produce a viable non-sterile offspring. But while after some time the branches were separated, the answer is a definite no, the less of the time spent, the more murky it becomes. Some populations might be biologically interfertile, but wouldn't mate with each other, and sometimes the differences within the populations are strong enough to be a deciding factor as to whether the resulting offspring would be viable and fertile or not. It is quite clear, however, that most often this separation takes a while, so the populations might accumulate enough differences for them to be considered at least subspecies and still be able to mate with each other, providing their offspring with a mix of traits otherwise impossible in the original populations. So, now we have a picture that pretty closely resembles what an evolutionary process really looks like. It is not as simple and intuitive as one might expect, and even in this form it's not entirely accurate, but it's good enough for the purposes of this video, which was to talk about the transitional species. In fact, it's good enough for us to apply a real lineage onto it. The human ancestry. Neat, huh? Well, unfortunately for us, during this presentation I have not been factoring in the reality of our perspective that makes things in the past less and less certain the further we go. So this picture is a bit too optimistic in regards to showing the exact ancestries. Without the genetic code to compare and sometimes even full fossils, it's impossible to place a species in a precise place with full certainty. But there's no need to be that precise to form the general picture which, while imperfect, is supported by enough evidence to be considered mostly accurate. Sure, this means that there is no way to be 100% certain that a given fossil is from a specimen that existed in a population that branched off of our species A and later branched into our species B. Maybe it's from a population that was already branched into species B before. Maybe a sister branch. Maybe it's a cousin branch. Maybe there was some interbreeding. But the fact is, reality doesn't operate in neat clear-cut boxes that are easy to find. No scientist operates under such an assumption. Yes, it is highly unlikely that, let's say, Archaeopteryx lithographica or Archaeopteryx cmnc was an ancestor of all modern birds in the sense that all of the species of modern birds branched out of a population that we find as fossils. But it doesn't matter if they weren't a direct ancestor. The importance of these fossils and all other fossils commonly used as examples of transitional species is that they exhibit the very mixture of traits that evolution would demand serving as evidence that even if we never find the fossils of the direct ancestor species, we see how these traits likely mixed in that one. And we see it sure as hell wasn't a crocodile.